Happy Friday, Baylor family, and welcome to Lariat TV News. I'm Grace Smith. And I'm Tim Longoria, bringing you this week's newscast outside the studio to adhere to social distancing guidelines. In this week's newscast, we'll look at one department's special tribute to two professors' late son and speak with Baylor President Linda Livingstone and preview the fall sports season. All that and more on Lariat TV News today. Let's get started. As our Bears are settling in on campus, there have been numerous questions about whether the university will continue in-person classes, how they plan to handle worst case scenarios, and why 4% tuition increase has been administered during a pandemic. LTVN's Drake Toll sat down with Baylor President Linda Livingstone for these answers and more. As for Baylor, what number do you look at as that trigger number? And secondly, is there a contingency plan if we hit that number? Well, I think it's really important to understand that there's not one trigger number that would cause us to decide to go into an online format. We are tracking probably hundreds of different data points. You see some of those on the public dashboard and those are certainly important to watch. And if you look at the public dashboard now, all of those metrics are moving down in the right direction. But we have many other metrics that we're, we're monitoring as well. And then we have a really highly qualified medical advisory group that um, reviews that medical or that those uh, data points every single day makes recommendations to my president's council and you really have to look at all of that data in total you look at positivity rate you look at rt you look at isolation capacity you look at your capacity to test and to trace and as you look at all of those in total i think what's more important is to say do we have the capacity to manage the number of COVID cases that we currently are dealing with? And we feel very good about that right now. We have a really good plan in place. We've adapted that plan as we've learned more and we're implementing that plan and it's, it's working. The data shows that what we're doing is making a difference. Facing a deadly virus, you know, Waco saw firsthand the death of Philip Perry earlier in March, what the virus can do. So if one Baylor student was to die from COVID complications after coming back to campus, will this reopen still be worth it? So, you know, we're, we call ourselves the Baylor family and we care deeply about the safety and health and well-being of our students and our faculty and staff. And I think, as I said, we have not seen any hospitalizations on our campus. We have certainly not had any deaths of anyone affiliated with our, our uh, on our campus since we've been back. And we feel good about the work we're doing, uh, the steps that we're taking to protect the campus and certainly come around the community to protect everyone that's involved as we go through the semester. So kind of taking a different turn. So the 4% increase in tuition, a lot of people are talking about that. I know it was something set years ago, but the university's decision to move forward with that, what kind of went into that? So that decision was made last summer in, in summer of 2019 by our Board of Regents. We set the, our tuition rates typically quite early compared to other institutions. And then you, uh, over that year, last year, we make plans based on that tuition increase. It has to do with our enrollment targets. It has to do with what we choose to do with financial aid and how we manage financial aid. And that is all built into the tuition increase that we that we uh, plan. And of course, all of that was done prior to even knowing that COVID-19 existed. Uh, so then when COVID-19 came along in the spring, which is really deep into our recruiting process and deep into the planning that we were doing, we recognized that we were going to have to make some adjustments because of COVID. And so we knew that from a budget perspective, there were going to be some uh, significant added expenses that we had to deal with because of that, uh, some significant financial support we would have to provide to students because we recognize that the families of many of our students and even our students ourselves have been impacted economically by this. And so all of that together, led us to feel like we were doing the right things with our budget, that we were moving in the right direction. And then of course, as we prepare to set tuition for next year, we'll factor all of those issues in as well. And, and that will certainly uh, help us determine what we do with tuition for next year. The first week of school, the positive cases of COVID-19 sparked concerns on campus. Baylor had multiple scares, including positive tests in residence hall hotspots, which resulted in the discovery of the virus in certain halls wastewater. Two floors of Martin Hall were quarantined for a few days and Collins underwent random testing of 15% of their residents after traces of the virus were discovered in the sewage. I talked to residents to hear their thoughts. 
it is a little weird. I read that and they said that there was positive cases in wastewater and I'm like, so I'm just living with a bunch of people who are positive. Baylor's handling it pretty well. I mean, letting us know, keeping us in the loop and giving us a lot of communication techniques. Um, but I am just a little bit worried about like what could happen in regards to having us being sent home or just um, getting our classes done. Because I know online classes was something that I was not looking forward to. By now, you've probably heard of Baylor's COVID-19 dashboard, and chances are you've taken a look at it for yourself. But have you noticed the latest addition to the COVID-19 tracker? LTVN's Nate Smith has more on one of Baylor's most useful tools. If you've taken a look at Baylor's COVID-19 dashboard in the last week or so, you've probably noticed the addition of a statistic labeled surveillance positivity, which equates to the percentage of people who tested positive for COVID-19 as a result of Baylor's newly implemented surveillance testing. And all of this begs the question, what is surveillance testing and what purpose does it serve? When we say surveillance testing, really what we're talking about is a random testing of 5% of students, faculty, staff, and contractors on a weekly basis. What that's going to allow us to do is to determine the true prevalence of COVID-19 uh, on, on our campus. So we added that figure to the dashboard on Friday to really give it in an effort of being open and transparent to give a true um, representation of what COVID is on our campus. When you look at Baylor's dashboard side by side with the dashboards of other prominent Texas universities such as TCU, Texas Tech, and the University of Texas, you'll notice that Baylor's offers a more detailed look at the COVID-19 situation on their campus. And sometimes this wide array of numbers and statistics that are thrown your way when looking at a COVID dashboard can be troubling. But according to Cook, context is key when deciphering these numbers. I think the key is, is not to zero in on any type of arbitrary numbers or a single number that's on the dashboard. It's really looking at can Baylor effectively uh, prevent manage and mitigate COVID-19 on our campus. While it may seem as if good news is hard to come by recently, Baylor did just record its lowest three-day total for new COVID-19 cases since the start of the fall semester. With the number of new cases being in the single digits both last Saturday and last Tuesday. This makes the number of new positive cases at Baylor in recent days comparable to the numbers at the schools I previously mentioned, despite the fact that Baylor is the only one of those institutions who is currently implementing surveillance testing. For Larry at TV News, I'm Nate Smith. The Baylor football program was set to kick off this week in Dave Aranda's first game in green and gold. But 38 confirmed cases of Louisiana Tech's football team means fans are now free at 11 a.m. Saturday. On Tuesday evening, the Bulldogs and Bears were forced to postpone the game after coronavirus spread rapidly throughout Tech's program. Yahoo Sports' Pete Thamel took to Twitter to break the news, and Baylor football confirmed the postponement shortly after. With no indication of rescheduling in sight, the chance the two teams meet later this season is also in jeopardy. As it sits, Baylor will open its campaign against Kansas at McLean Stadium on September 26th. Stay tuned to the Lariat's coverage, as it's still possible for the Bears to schedule a game on an open date September 19th. Though Baylor is in the middle of a pandemic, another fever students are catching is cabin fever. The third floor of Penland, commonly referred to as the Dirty Third, turned their hallway into a slip and slide in a viral video. LTVN's Madison Martin tells us more about what happened. This past weekend, a video went viral here at Penland Hall. Let's take a look. Shown on both Instagram and Twitter, the video has gained over 22,000 views since being posted on Sunday. After several attempts of contacting residents, CLs, and student life officials, no formal statement has been given about what happened on the third floor of Penland. In addition to this, student life is looking into what happened in the hall and cracking down on students to prevent creating a COVID-19 hotspot in the dorm. For Laria TV News, I'm Madison Martin. Baylor University has strategically placed workers around high populated areas throughout campus to enforce the coronavirus rules at all times. Making sure masks are worn over the nose and big groups are split up are not simple tasks for the people who don the neon green. 25 members of the event staff for football and basketball games are being used to enforce the wearing of masks at all times. Since big events are postponed for the time being, Baylor has found good use for the stalled employees. There are more people following the rules, I say, than there are people that are not following the rules, I say that. So that makes me feel good that, that at least most people are, 
concerned and they're trying. And the percentage of the people who might not wear it is so small that, you know, eventually we'll pull them in, you know. It's, 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 a, it's a minor occurrence. Like, it's rarely that we see it every now and then. The help provided by the staff who enforces the COVID-19 rules is influential to Baylor's efforts to keep the virus positivity rate as low as possible. We go around, walk around, tell them, put your mask on, please, and, and everybody been doing it. Don't have no issue with it. The Baylor community has done a fantastic job in abiding by these inconvenient rules. We thank the mask staff for doing their job and keeping us safe. For Larry at TV News, I'm Tim Longoria. This year, September 11th marks the 19th anniversary of the terrorist attack on the World Trade Center and Pentagon. On this day, we will remember the tragic loss of life and the heroic actions of our first responders. Four commercial airlines were hijacked and targeted to hit important U.S. landmarks. Two planes were crashed into the Twin Towers. One hit the Pentagon and because of the heroic actions of the passengers on Flight 93, the last plane was directed into a vacant field in Pennsylvania. The entire Baylor Lariat family stands with all those deeply impacted and remembers all of those whose lives were forever changed. Up next, we'll show you how teachers have kept their sanity and stayed organized while starting this semester. We'll also hear from both the head soccer and volleyball coaches about the start of their seasons. That is just around the corner. We'll be right back. The best and brightest are drawn to Baylor, where those from many backgrounds with many talents shine together before casting their light outward to illuminate the world through transformational learning opportunities that are grounded in Christian faith and service, and research that impacts lives and communities. Baylor University, a place where lights shine bright. Losing a child is an unbearable pain for parents to endure. Two Baylor professors are carrying this burden now, but they are not alone. LTVN's Bryn Shavia Jordan spoke with a department on campus that stepped in and offered support to this grieving family, showing them Baylor cares beyond the classroom. Baylor University has a reputation of promoting family within the Baylor community, and two professors were able to experience this when they faced the unimaginable. Pat and Rebecca Flavin's 16-month-old son Felix died after many complications since birth due to a heart defect. He spent his last days on a ventilator fighting for his life when the flu turned into pneumonia. During the Summer Faculty Institute, their colleagues heard about the tragic news and felt compelled to do something. For a time of prayer, um, we convened the music faculty together and decided to, to create this tribute. And really, it was, it was an effort to bring some small comfort to a family that um, experiencing the most horrible, tragic loss imaginable. The four minute and eight second tribute included songs of faith, such as Amazing Grace and Jesus Loves Me. Dr. Kimberly, who was also a part of the tribute, explained why this meant so much to her. It's an honor. It's an honor to be part of something like that. It was an honor to join my colleagues with their gifts, but um, mostly it was just something that we wanted to do for Felix and for his parents because it's a very difficult time and the best thing we can do is show our love. The family expressed their gratitude for their students who sent them prayers and scriptures and their colleagues who stepped in when needed. Saying in quote, it's hard to put into words how grateful we are for this outpouring of love as we grieve our sweet baby. Family comes first at Baylor. So I think the most important thing to the faculty is caring for the students and caring for each other. Baylor certainly cares reaches out, not just at a professional level, but on a personal personal level as well. For Laird TV News, I'm Brent Shabia Jordan. Readers rejoice. New additions are coming to Armstrong Browning Library here at Baylor. $300,000 will be used to fund the publishing of volumes 31 through 33 of the Browning's correspondence. The National Endowment for the Humanities has helped fund the Browning's cause since 1979. Armstrong Browning Library and the Browning's Correspondence Project is a tip of the cap towards Robert and Elizabeth Barrett Browning. Their personalized letters throughout the 19th century are used daily by the Baylor family. Breaking barriers. Professors and students are overcoming the physical barriers that masks and social distancing in the classroom cause, altering the student-professor relationship more than ever. I spoke with a professor who has extensive research in interpersonal and nonverbal communication. 
it's kind of fun to navigate, right? And just figure it out. It's just still so good to see my students again in person. Resilient and positive. The two words Dr. Jane Dameron used to describe Baylor communication students as they returned back to the classroom in the midst of COVID-19. Students are rising to the challenge and they are like being even more engaged and more devoted and more attentive to all the communication because they know how much it matters to stay safe and to stay on campus. Professor Dameron, senior lecturer in the Department of Communication, researches and teaches courses focusing on intentional communication. It's so important for me to feel connected to my students relationally and interpersonally because I feel like that creates um, a more engaging learning environment and I've, I've found that my students are more excited about the material when they feel more connected to me and to each other. But how do masks and social distant classrooms affect this important connection? I've been fascinated just from a nonverbal standpoint how I can still um, do what I was doing. I move around the classroom as far as the front of the room. I move around a lot. I use bigger gestures and I think that that helps my message to still be understandable and dynamic even though a big part of my face, which students are used to watching, you know, someone's face and kind of reading their lips, even though that's covered, I think you can compensate for that by amping up the other parts of your nonverbal communication. Dameron now rolls this kit to class each morning full of wipes, sanitizer, masks, and her air purifier. I think we just have to get over this awkwardness, you know, more than anything. Um, and, uh, Try, try to sort of make the classroom as, as normal as it used to be. Dr. David Schluter, professor and chair of communication, said while technology can deliver education in an interesting way, Nothing replaces the face-to-face -face classroom experience. Even with all these classroom barriers, both Dameron and Schluter both encourage students to stay connected in other ways, like email and Zoom calls. For Lariat TV News, I'm Grace Smith. Football isn't the only sport coming back this fall. Baylor soccer is set to be the first squad on campus to get back in the action this Friday when they're set for a 7 p.m. kickoff with TCU at Betty Lou Mays Field. Here's head coach Paul Jobson on how it feels to finally get back on the pitch. I think there's a little bit of uh, a little bit of disbelief at this point, yeah. right? I mean, it, it, for so long you just are wondering, hey, is this? You know, you're optimistic, but you're just kind of wondering, hey, is this is this really going to happen or not? And I, I just uh, being a day away and you know, with with both teams getting great results with their COVID testing prior to matches, it, it's going to happen. So um, we're just super excited. The girls are excited. Um, you know, I just it's almost like uh, the, the day before Christmas. Along with other sports returning this fall, head volleyball coach Ryan McGuire and his team can't wait to take the stage. The volleyball team will be hitting the road on September 25th to face the Kansas Jayhawks in their first two matches of the season. Coming off a nearly perfect campaign, Coach McGuire is thankful that his team will be able to play again this year. You know, I'm thankful the Big 12 has been able to press on and, and then we can move forward. And, and our girls have really just enjoyed being together. So it's a, it's a different schedule than anyone we've had before. and, and you know, I think it presents some challenges, but also presents uh, a lot of things that we can, can highlight and be excited about. We, we open up on the road against a Kansas team that's got a lot of uh, new players, great recruits, good transfers, and uh, we have no idea what they'll look like. And, um, you know, they know a little bit about us. It was a new twist on dancing in the moonlight, kayaking in the moonlight. Every once in a full moon, Baylor hosts a late night kayak float on the marina for all bears to enjoy. LTVN's Winston Margaritas was there to talk to some of the bears that partook in the sold out fun on the Brazos. Baylor bears lined up at the Poland Family Marina to enjoy some outdoor fun. My favorite part was probably just, I don't know, like the beauty of it, of it all. Like kayaking on a river on Baylor campus right by McLean Stadium. It's just like so beautiful. This has been a way to like release energy and release stress as well, so that's really good. <laughs> the event is one of many that will take place this fall. And especially with these circumstances, like, I think they're doing a very good job to help us get like somewhat of an experience at least. So I'm very grateful. For Lariat TV News, I'm Winston Margaritas. Between school and the pandemic, stress is no stranger to this Baylor family. Students were eager to stretch away their worries at the Neon Bash held this Wednesday at the Slick. LTVN's Madison Martin was there to capture the action. 
With the pandemic having no signs of ending, students are excited to exercise a healthy stress outlet at the Neon Bash. The energy that I can get from the other people, uh, that keeps me sane. And uh, <laughs> this is a busy schedule, especially with this crazy COVID. Um, um, but also, like, you know, like, there's like, something that I can look forward to. The assistant director of wellness, Van Davis, shares the health benefits students receive from joining in some of the workouts they provide. Just being around other people, that is, you know, it helps with the mental, um, the mental um, health, it helps with the physical well-being, and uh, it just brings people together in a positive environment, which is, which is so great right now. We need that. We need that. Students are encouraged to join in the fun at the Neon Bash for a much-needed daily dose of social interaction. If you're looking for social connection in a social distance way, it's a great way to come out and meet other people as well as move your body. Um, all the instructors, they'll tell you to move at your own pace so you never feel pressured to overwork yourself. It's just a great positive community to be a part of. COVID-19 has unfortunately canceled one thing after another, but one classic Baylor event hasn't been swayed. Dr. Pepper Hour has continued to provide the Baylor experience for 67 years, even though this year looks a little different. I spent my Tuesday afternoon checking out these sweet treats. I think it's like a grab and go type system, but they're also making it really accessible for us so that we can still carry on the tradition that so many people love. Students and faculty rapidly come and go for the hour the floats are offered. Even with masks on and standing six feet apart, people seem to find it just as enjoyable as the previous years. I know it's a big tradition. I think the key word is, in that sense is tradition because it's not really about the Dr. Pepper or anything to me. It's just about the fact that we can get here every Tuesday at 3, you know, just all gathered together, even though it looks very different from how it has in the past. Baylor continues to update its community on positive cases and testing while providing solutions to keep the students safe and give them the best college experience possible. What we're doing is we have a lot of stickers on the ground where you get to be six feet apart. Of course, there's also the mask regulation that everybody has to wear a mask inside the building. And people are not allowed to just mingle and hang out in the, um, in the ballroom anymore. So they have to exit out through the sides. But it is still here in the sub. Our bears are thankful for traditions that continue to take place, like Dr. Pepper Hour, for giving us a much needed taste of normalcy. For Larry at TV News, I'm Tim Longoria. From COVID-19 updates to viral videos, that's all for this week's newscast. Be sure to watch us on BaylorLariat.com, YouTube, or the Waco City channel. Thanks for watching Baylor Lariat TV News. Tune in next Friday for more Baylor-focused content about Baylor for Baylor.